I'm Bethany Anderson, and you're listening to The Hope Adventure. Welcome to Episode 36. Friends, I am so excited because I want to share with you that just this past week on March 5th, I celebrated my one-year anniversary of doing the Hope Adventure podcast. So thank you for tuning in faithfully and consistently and being such an encouraging supporter of this podcast. The Hope Adventure is a place for God stories and conversations, all with the intent of reminding us that the greatest adventure is His presence. And His presence is embedded with hope. On today's episode of the podcast, I am honored to be interviewing a longtime friend, mentor, leader of mine, Dr. Myron Wilson. He is the executive director of a nonprofit called Direction 613, which is all about helping foster youth who are aging out of the system thrive as adults. I love this conversation. I love the organic nature of the way these things go because I always walk away encouraged and inspired. We talk a lot about belonging and what does it mean to really offer a safe place of rescue for people. And so I just encourage you to grab a cup of tea or coffee and sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Myron. Are you ready? Let's go. So, Myron, welcome to the Hope Adventure Podcast. I am super excited to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Really uh, honored that you give me the opportunity to share with you. Yeah, well, I'm excited because, as you know, one of the goals of the Hope Adventure Podcast is really just to invite people into the bigger story of God around the world. Just so happens that you are based here in McKinney, Texas, and we've known each other for A long time. Would you like to say how we're connected? Uh, Well, we're connected because when I came to serve at First Baptist Church in McKinney, you were, I think, in the eighth grade. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's right. right. (laughs) (laughs) So, and then we've been serving together in worship ministry and different things that we've done together for quite some time since then. Yeah, that's right. You you can tell, we can tell lots of stories on each other, oh, yeah, I'll put it that way. <laughs> There's some good ones. Well, today you're on here because you run an amazing ministry, um, reaching a need that is something that I think a lot of people don't think about. And I would love for you to share a little bit about what you're doing now, what your ministry is all about. Give us maybe a little bit of a backstory of how you got there and um, just take it from there. Okay. Sure. Uh, well, as mentioned, I was I was on staff and working at First Baptist Church in McKinney, and uh, this was about seven years ago. And we typically had people come through the church that were in need, that might be transient or homeless. I got a call one day, and uh, uh, reception said they had a young woman that needed to talk to somebody. And I went to the front, and uh, she was nineteen years old and was homeless and had aged out of foster care. Mm. And at that time, I did not even know what aged out of foster care was. Uh, Came to take care of her, and then uh, Stacy and I took her into our home for several weeks. And then one day, she got up and uh, went to her van and loaded up and and drove off. And uh, I was Mm. left wondering, all right, God, what's that about? Why did why did that happen? Uh, yeah. Trying to figure out why why that took place. Um, it wasn't long after that that I was officiating a wedding downtown McKinney, and I came across a couple that uh, worked with uh, foster youth in East Texas, and they had a relationship uh, in downtown Dallas uh, with someone who did uh, homeless ministry, and I was curious as to why they were working with someone in homeless ministry when they were doing foster care in East Texas. Mm. And that's when they told me that almost uh, 40% of the homeless population in Texas. And for the most part in the United States are kids that have aged out of foster care. Uh, And so when I realized that foster care was essentially putting 18 year old kids out on the street, 
when they aged out, I felt compelled and really moved and called to, to do something and to get involved and take action. Um, awesome. I, I tell people, uh, you know, my belief is that uh, aging out foster youth are essentially a, a, an unreached people group. And most of the time that terminology is used for people overseas in far distant lands where, uh, where the word of God hasn't uh, been spread yet. But uh, yeah. it's clearly evident right here in our own backyard here in the United States that, that that's what these young people are, an unreached people group. Yeah. Wow. So um, uh, we began the ministry before I, I departed First Baptist, and we had been going a couple of years formulating bylaws and policies and procedures and gaining strategy. And then uh, in the midst of all that, someone called me one day and said, I've heard what you're doing. And we have a home and we want to donate the home to you. And that was the catalyst that really launched the the ministry to the Mm -hmm. next level. Uh, Now we have two homes here in McKinney. Uh, First home is for young women ages 16 to 22 who are in foster care and they will be aging out. Uh, We say they're aging out. It's a process that starts at age 16. And at age 18, they age out, but they can file for extended care to age 22. And then across the street, we have a second home, and it's for pregnant girls in foster care. And they're the most vulnerable because very few people are going to take these young women into their homes. Yeah. And wow. so, uh, and then our plan is to open a third home, hopefully in May or June, based on on contributions and so forth. Uh, we'll open a home for young men uh, in uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, and so that's what we do. And, uh, I'm the executive director and I give oversight to all of that. And, uh, my first calling is to give spiritual direction and to point, uh, point our kids towards Christ. Many of them have no spiritual, uh, reference. Uh, they believe in God or that there is a God. Uh, and then some of them are agnostic or skeptic and have no belief or trust in God based on the experience in their lives. And uh, these young kids uh, are all very, very vulnerable and broken, have had great trauma. Mm. Uh, Many of the kids that we get have been trafficked in the sex trade, and uh, all of them have been abused to some degree and have faced rejection time and time again. Uh, We've had residents that have lived in as many as 18 homes since their sixth grade year. and. and so forth. So you can see that uh, there's, it's a life of trauma and, uh, and so many ups and downs. And so that's my first priority is to point them towards Jesus. And then of course, in nonprofit world, one of the big responsibilities is to, to do fundraising and to raise funds to support the ministry and then manage the, and give oversight. And uh, that's what I do. Yeah. And the name of the ministry is Direction 613. Yes. Um, what can you talk a little bit about what's the meaning behind that? Where did it come from? And I imagine that's part of your vision towards what you're trying to do, but Absolutely. Absolutely. When we started out, the the name of the organization was was Oak Creek Place. And uh that was based on a on a location and we looked at it and we said, well, it, it fits. It's the name of the home. And, uh, and, but then as we got into it, we said, if we're going to build a network of homes, which is our goal, a network of homes to reach the need, we decided that Oak Creek place would not work because it, it described a a geographic location. We needed something that would, would be, uh, an umbrella over the various homes. And so Mm -hmm. Isaiah 61, three is the verse that we, that we reference giving kids direction is our hope. Uh, Isaiah 61, three talks about, uh, providing for those who grieve, and uh, it goes on to say to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Yeah, and so our hope, good. and then at the very end of that, it says they will be oaks of righteousness, mm. uh, planting in a display of God's splendor. So the hope yeah. is that we would establish in these in these young people uh, a sense of having purpose. And then being planted in society as vibrant, young, thriving Christian young men and women. That's awesome. I love that. I love that verse. And I think it's exactly what we're called to do 
uh, as we as we carry Jesus. Um, what's that you talked about? I know you have the two homes for the women. I think it's it's awesome that you guys have sort of targeted to open a home for pregnant young women who do mm-hmm. seem the most vulnerable in that situation. Um, what would you say is the statistical difference between how many boys versus girls you come across in the foster system? Uh, there are actually uh, more young women. Uh, that we see that are in need. Now that is changing because culturally people feel uh, a little more comfortable reaching out to young women. So as other people are taking Mm -hmm. note and awareness is being raised, there are more opportunities for young women, I believe, in the foster care system than there are for young men. Now there are some ministries that are focused strictly on ministry young men, uh, but by and large, the most vulnerable are, are pregnant girls. Uh, they have very uh, few options. Uh, you have to understand, it's not many people that are going to take in a troubled teenager into their family dynamic right. and, yeah. and jeopardize that dynamic with their own mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. So the, the opportunities are, are greatly reduced the older these kids get in the foster care system. Uh, and then pregnant girls, that's even a greater vulnerability, uh, and and people are less likely to even bring them in knowing that, okay, there are greater complications and more drama and just more to deal with. So they're very resistant to the notion of taking in a pregnant girl that they don't know. And then lastly uh, would be would be the young men. I, I believe if you were to put them in priority of need, it would be the pregnant girls in foster care young men would be two, and then uh, then young women ages 16 to 22 would be uh, the next level that are in need. Wow. It's really, I mean, it's really interesting because I think only in hearing you talk about this, you realize that um, a lot of the foster kids become part of the homeless population. And I think in the culture we live in, it's, it's just like part of your story was that why are these foster people working with a homeless group? Like, where's the connect? And I think that's a disconnect that a lot of us culturally have. It's a misunderstanding. Can you talk more about um, maybe the reasons behind that? Or or is is there some sort of, I don't want to say choice that goes into that. Is it just assumed that when you're a foster kid that your next lot is homelessness? Or can you talk a little bit around that connection? Uh, To some degree, yes. It, It just... It simply depends on uh, the type of environment that you have been uh, subjected to. So if you can imagine for a moment that you're uh, a young person in foster care and you're 10 or 11 years old, after you reach that threshold of 10 or 11 years, your opportunities to be adopted are pretty are pretty minimal. They begin mm-hmm. to go down. Many, many people adopt uh, smaller kids that are in foster care. They're not as intimidating. Mm-hmm. You have the opportunity to influence them and breathe into them uh, behavior, and mm-hmm. you spare them from a lot of trauma at a younger age. So uh, when you take them in at a younger age, it's just easier, bottom line. The older they get, the more difficult it becomes because they've been from one home to another. And uh, as it progresses, then uh, these young people, many of them have not been given life skills. No one has really sat down and nurtured them and and told them this is, you know, these are the things that you need to do and how Mm -hmm. to live. They try to do it in through child protective services in the state of Texas and most states, they have a program, but it's it's a program and it's run by the state and kids are mainly disconnected from that type of involvement. So when they reach age 18, the mindset for these young people, for instance, uh, we've had residents that have been in, like I said, 18 different homes since their sixth grade year, they're about to graduate, they can, stay with foster care until their 22nd birthday, Mm -hmm. but many of them have the mindset of, I can do a better job of taking care of myself than what CPS has because Uh, I've got so many homes. And uh, they think they can do that. And what 16 or 17-year-old is not ready to leave 
the the house and go out on their own. Uh, my own kids wanted to leave. They thought <laughs> yeah, at age 15, right. they could be on their own. Right, and, right. Uh, <laughs> and I, there were times I said, I think I'm ready for you to be on. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so you have these kids that, uh, you know, bless their hearts. They've had great, great uh, rejection. And uh, now they are at an age where they want to be independent and that desire to be on their own is there, but they're not equipped. And so they get out on their own thinking that they can make it. And then reality hits and they find themselves ill-prepared. They don't have funds. They don't have support. They don't have a mom or dad that they can call on the phone and say, can you help me? Uh, And they're alone. And so they become uh, couch surfers. Uh, They end up going from home to home. And eventually that transitions and leads into other things such as uh, drug abuse, sexual abuse, incarceration, and then homelessness, and all of the above. Wow. Uh, so um, hopefully, you know, we can do our part to to minister to as many kids and keep that from happening. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, it's interesting because in in my travels around the world, and I'm sure as you've traveled, um, you've seen this as well, is a lot of times in communities where there's vulnerable populations, there's a lack of something called social capital. So Mm -hmm. you talk about financial capital and financial wealth, but actually social wealth, a connectedness to key relationships, people that could support you if you were in financial trouble or emotional trouble, or if you needed um, just even help spiritually with something Um, oftentimes this group of people that you're talking about, these foster kids that are aging out of the system, what they're lacking is social capital that's based on their own relationships and not just a system that's supported them. Because then when the system stops, then what happens to the social capital? There is none. Um, and that's, it sounds like that's, that is the leading factor in, you know, any of us really could be homeless. Um, regardless of trauma or things in our life, any of us would be vulnerable to that. But many of us are blessed with the social capital in those relationships. And for me, that's always just a humbling thought. And that's what you're providing these kids. You're you're providing a relational support network where you're pointing them to Christ and teaching them about really who they are in Him. Um, and you're providing sort of hope for them as well. That's that is the the hope that we have, and that is really what we target. Is that more than anything, you, we can provide for their physical needs, uh, but everyone has an innate uh, desire and a need to belong. And uh, one of the things that we do is we we tell all of our residents that come in, uh, you know, you're a part of the Direction sixty one three family. Mm, you will never so cease to be a part of the family. I have young women that call me now that have uh, left our program and some of them are, are doing well. Some of them are not doing well. They're, they're out on the streets and uh, they text me. Uh, they call me regularly and we do what we can to help them, but they know that they always have a connectedness to us and that we will try to help them uh, at any time, even though they're not residents, mm-hmm. they're still a part of this community. And uh, all of our residents, we tell them that, that if you do decide to leave and you can always count on belonging here. And uh, we hope that they will find that. And of course, the ultimate belonging is having a relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And we, we point them in that direction. Um, but I'm reminded, my daughter told me when she was 18 years old, I, I remembered it distinctly. Uh, she was about to go off to college. And so I was I was breathing into her every spiritual value that I had because I thought I don't have much time with her. And uh, she finally said to me one day as we were driving down the highway, dad, you can't choose Jesus for me. Mm. I've got to choose him for myself. And so the same is with these young women and these young men that we will have in soon. Uh, We can't force Christ on them, but we can point them in that direction and that is our goal, is to give them an ultimate direction of a relationship with Jesus, knowing that that is the biggest key to their success and for them to be able to thrive once they once they're out on their own. Yeah. One of the, I love that. I love that thought. I love what she said. I know your daughter, so 
I'm not surprised. It was a very yep. profound statement yep. at a young age, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. Cause one of the things that I remember when I was, I was doing a uh, mission work, I was living in England, but I was in Amsterdam doing, um, some mission work with the church there. And it's what they called a messy church, meaning this is like a phrase they use where it's, it's very organic. It's not structured at all. And you just kind of see who comes in that day and you kind of work around, you know, who comes in the door. Well, this was in a community of um, a lot of vulnerable people for different reasons. And we talked about how a lot of ministries and a lot of churches have this model of there's three words, behave, believe, and belong. And a lot of ministries and churches have it backwards where they require you to behave or believe first, and then you can belong. Yes. Actually, organic incarnational ministry always starts with belonging. Mm-hmm. So when someone belongs, what's modeled to them is the community and the relationship aspect of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that we belong at home. We're at home in Him. We're at home in Him and with other people. And out of that belonging, that sense of knowing that this place is mine, there's like an ownership there, then I begin to believe, and then I begin to behave out of that when it comes to specifically the Christian beliefs. But I love what you said about belonging is that the first thing that you tell them is, it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what your story is, you belong here. Absolutely. And and after serving in local church for 35 years, I would, I would agree. I don't think that's the desire of leadership in local church. No. I think that leadership would want us to uh, accept people as they are and, uh, and then move forward from there. Uh, it's a reality that, that comes from the heritage, heritage of church. But I will tell you, in, in our world where we are working with these young, vulnerable youth, it is exactly opposite. It is exactly as you, as you mm-hmm. said, to where they come in and they belong first. Yeah. And then, uh, then hopefully they will, they will learn to assume uh, lifestyles of Christ and, and proceed after that. But uh, they belong immediately, and we, we don't judge. We just talk to them about faith, and they are accepted, and we give them the freedom to speak and explain where they've come from and to say if they believe or not and to be okay with that and uh, to object. And uh, it's refreshing. Uh, it's also challenging because many of our preconceived ideas as believers, especially if we've been raised in the church and been in church all of our lives, a lot of times they uh, they destroy those those norms and those behaviors, and they challenge that. and yeah. uh, And it's good. It's healthy. Yeah, it's healthy. That's very it really healthy. Is. I love that. I would love to ask you. Um, you've been doing this for a couple years now. I'm sure you have all sorts of stories. You've already yeah. shared a little bit of those. Um, where would you say is the place that you've seen God at work most um, in you and also through the ministry? Okay. I would say uh, for me, uh, he's challenged me to walk by faith much more than I felt like I was allowing myself to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy to become complacent when you're in, in a comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when you're dealing with people and you're dealing with broken people, there's not a formula that you can just apply to every person. Mm -hmm. And in order to reach those people and to problem solve, I look at it like opportunity. I'm very much an opportunist. And I I believe every time a, a kid walks through the door that, uh, I hear, you know, about their stories. It's an opportunity for, for me and for my staff to yeah. show them and uh, point them towards hope. And um, so in that respect, uh, I've had to rely heavily on God for, for wisdom and uh, decision-making and how to connect and how to love and, uh, you know, what to say, what not to say, those types of things, and uh, with each individual resident, and to mm-hmm. connect, uh, you, you're always looking for a way to connect with with that resident, and for them to connect with you, and to connect with someone in the ministry that they can trust. 
Mm-hmm. Much of what uh, of what we see is people that don't trust and they don't uh, they don't believe. They just don't have a lot of hope. Mm-hmm. But after you develop relationship, you start to see that uh, take place. Uh, I've seen residents come in, uh, young women come in. I one girl in particular. Uh, didn't speak to me for two weeks. She would Mm -hmm. not look me in the eye. Uh, She wouldn't talk to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, now she's still with us. And now to watch her, she is uh, a vibrantly growing young woman and uh, just exciting to see God transforming her life. She even referenced uh, recently how she saw God at work in because people had been praying for her and how God had done some things because of prayer. Mm. And uh, that was not even a possibility seven Mm. or eight months ago when she came into our program, watching the transformation of, of people and of young people in particular and seeing life change, Mm. uh, watching life change firsthand and those day-to-day conversations and the little steps that you take to invest in people. And then, watching God do his work. Uh, so much of this is what God does when we're not even there. Uh, that is the most rewarding thing mm. to experience. That's awesome. I love that. I love the, just see the, just see God's hands all over it. You know, oh, you, yeah. you have oh, this yeah. experience, you know, several years ago in the middle of um, leading a large ministry at a large church. And it's like a seed that God planted and it continued to water and and now you are where you are today, and he's invited you to be a part of the story of bringing hope um, to these young kids. Speaking of the word hope, you've mentioned that a couple of times. I would just love to know what that word means to you. Well, you know, in, in the context of what I do, uh, and, and I have two schools of thought, I guess, uh, that that would relate to hope. I think for me, hope is uh, a word that comes to mind is rescue. Uh, and the reason I say that is, uh, mm. I think it's it's that possibility uh, of rescue that we look towards to be rescued and to be comforted, to be uh, to be safe, to find relief from our present life circumstances, to be rescued from our present life circumstances, and uh, and everyone has this desire, I believe, to to have uh, a peace uh, and that peace really is, it comes from God only. Uh, mm. And in the context of, of eternity, you know, scripture talks about uh, it's uh, first Thessalonians and, and Paul talks about, uh, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Yeah. Uh, well, he's speaking of an eternal hope, hope that's found in Jesus. Mm. And at some point in time, we will all be rescued Mm-hmm. From this present life, we will no longer face uh, conflict. There won't be the struggle of life. There won't be the pain of life. We'll be rescued from that. And uh, and to me, that that is what I believe uh, encompasses the concept of hope. Mm. I love that. I've never heard anyone. I mean, obviously, within your context, you are face to face with rescue a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way you explain that just, I had a, I had a situation in my own life where, um, I was in a ministry situation that was really painful for me several years ago. And when I was released from that situation, I had a good friend of mine say, you've been rescued. And that's what I just was reminded of when you were talking about that. And obviously that's a simple example from my own life, but, um, I, I just, I love the concept of rescue there. Um, well, and that's what speaks to me. And, and, and of course, a lot of that is informed by where I am right now, and the type of ministry that I have. Yeah, but it's great. I mean, it's a great, it's a great concept to think on for anybody who's listening. Mm-hmm. Um, so I talk a lot about on this podcast that the greatest adventure is the presence of God. Mm-hmm. That's, that's something that is, I'm, I'm fascinated by the adventure of God and I love his presence. And so that's where that comes out of for me personally, but I would love to know your thoughts about that. Um, I would say uh, when I think about adventure and presence of God, uh, I think on the fact that, well, in Genesis 2, God says it's not good for man to be alone. I think Mm -hmm. uh, one of the basic needs is for everyone to have companionship. And, of course, that deepest, most intimate companionship comes from the relationship and the presence of God. 
And it's not something that's based like a physical presence where you walk into a room and someone is there. Mm -hmm. This is a presence that's with you everywhere you go. Yeah. And uh, of course, for the Christ follower, that's being connected through prayer, uh, but also knowing that that you have this indwelling spirit and that God's with you all the time. Mm-hmm. Now, my personality, uh, you know, I'm a process type person and I'm a task driven person. I wake up in the morning and I'm ready to charge the day. Mm-hmm. And and personally, I catch myself uh, and probably most people, if if they're honest, we vacillate between this thing of trying to do life on our own and out of our own thoughts and out of our own energies. And we push God to the side. Mm -hmm. But when I'm at my greatest moment and when we're at our greatest moment as Christ followers, it's when we let the abiding spirit of God take over. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're just, we're focused on him. And we're reminded, you know, Luke nine says that Jesus uh, didn't even have a place to rest his head. Uh, but he was in the presence of God all the time, no matter mm. where he was. Yeah. And he was abiding in that. And that is an adventure in itself, is to knowing that Jesus didn't have a static place that he remained. He was constantly on the move and constantly following God's leading. And uh, I think that's the example that we have to have if we're going to abide in him. Mm. I love that. I love that. I personally love the thought. Um, okay. In light of all the things that we've been talking about, uh, what would be your best advice for anyone listening to this podcast today? Uh, it's not about us. Hmm. Bottom line, life is not about us. Uh, it's about God first and everything that we do is for his glory. Uh, the way we live our motivations, everything we do should be to please him first. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think second to that is is it's about others, is to help others mm-hmm. and to breathe into others. And uh, Jesus lived that way. And yeah. he, he talked about the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul. And, yeah. and then the second was to love others as yourself. And I think uh, in my mind, as a, as a Christ follower, we have to be careful not to buy into the culture. It's counterintuitive to think about others and not to think about self mm-hmm. uh, in our, in our culture. And the cultural yeah. paradigm is to, is to focus on self and improving self and bettering self. Uh, but if we want to experience hope and adventure, uh, we must live a life of selflessness and, and focus on other people. Uh, one of the great statements in, in a book that came out years ago was uh, by Erwin McManus, and uh, it was called The Barbarian Way. Oh, I love and, that book. And it's a great book. And I, th- I think I read it because of you, actually. I remember. It's just a powerful yeah, book. And, yeah. And it, and it just talks about really living with abandon and, and kind of a reckless abandon to go and knowing it, the spirit mm-hmm. that God guides you and, and don't be concerned about all the things that the world says you should be concerned about. Uh, and, uh, that's, you know, that's what I would encourage people to, to do is to live a barbarian way. (laughs) And, uh, and I, I, you know, one of my great role models was our good friend, Leo Mm O'Connor and, uh, from South Africa Mm -hmm. and Leo really, you know, he gave me a lot of uh, challenges in my own life when I watched how he was living and yeah. he lived a barbarian spirit. He was out there and he was living for others. And mm. I took a page from his book and that has, that has influenced me in, in what I do now. Uh, and I work with kids and he worked with kids. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's, that's a big part of, of what I would tell people is live recklessly or in a barbarian way for mm. Jesus. I love that. I'm just remembering literally. So I used to work with you on staff in the, in the music ministry. And I remember reading that book in that season of life and having, um, just being discouraged. I was raising money to move overseas and I had people say, Bethany, why don't you just stay here and do ministry for free? Which is a joke. You can't ever do ministry for free. God always provides, but it takes money just like anything else. And, um, Later, this person who had spoken these really negative things over me, later this person picked up this very book that we're talking about 
and said, I get it. You are trying to live the barbarian way. And um, it's really cool that you tied that into Leo. I haven't talked much about Leo on this podcast. Maybe I will as inspired by um, just you bringing him up. But I love that. I I can literally, from where I'm sitting, I can see the barbarian way sitting on my bookshelf. So, (laughs) Oh, that's great. (laughs) That's awesome. It it always comes full circle. Yeah, that's great. That's super. Yeah. So, well, I have so enjoyed this conversation. I love these kind of just organic conversations. I love not, this is how I approach them. I just approach them with no plan and just trusting that God's going to show up and um, we're going to talk about what he wants to highlight. And I've been really encouraged by our conversation. And, Great. Um, well, yeah, and I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate what you're doing, Bethany. And uh, it's great to be a part of this. Uh, it, it's been enjoyable to talk with you. And I'm, I'm hoping that it encourages other believers, yeah. uh, other people that are in leadership and uh, maybe just, you know, help someone to, that perhaps is kind of in a standstill helps mm-hmm. him to move or find some, some direction and purpose. Yeah. I know. I, I believe that it will. And I always say, even if it's just for one person, but oftentimes, yeah, you know, God yeah. expands the reach, but I would love to tell people what's the best way they can connect with you and direction 61 three. Um, you can tell us the yeah. best way to do that. Well, well uh, certainly our social media is, is one way that you can follow what we do and, uh, and be informed. Uh, it's direction six, one, three. Uh, it's easy to find on, on Facebook and, uh, and on Instagram and so forth. Um, our webpage is www.direction six, one, three, no colon in there. Like it would be in the scripture. It's just six, one, three dot org. And, uh, I would encourage people if they want to follow us on a, on a more informed way and have more understanding and, and maybe receive uh, greater insight uh, to go to our webpage and register to receive our digital uh, newsletter. Mm-hmm. It's a bi-monthly newsletter. Uh, awesome. We email it out and it has all types of updates as to what's taking place. Sometimes an update uh, from a, from a resident, some mm-hmm. resident cool. may write a, a quick note just to thank people and let them know what's taking place in her life. Uh, but then there, there are fundraiser announcements and so forth. And then vision. We have a we have a big vision. We have a master plan vision that we're working on. And it's much, much greater than the two homes that we have right now. Mm. And uh, that will be on our web page soon so that people can see uh, where we're going to go. Because certainly without a vision, uh, the ministry ministry perishes. And uh, yeah. so I encourage people to, to go there and then they will they'll find out just about anything they need. And of course they can call us or email us at any time. And our email addresses are out there. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Myron. It's been such a blessing for me. I know I am confident that this uh, conversation with will bless others. And um, thanks again for your time. Sure thing. You have a blessed day, girl. Okay. Thanks. Uh Bye-bye. listening to today's episode of the hope adventure i hope you were really encouraged and inspired by my conversation with myron i really encourage you to check out their website at direction 613.org they're really doing some incredible things to help youth age out of the foster care system and so they could really use your support your prayers and even a financial donation if you feel led to give that way And now just a few more quick things before we leave. In honor of the one year anniversary of this podcast, I would love your feedback. I would love to know what have been some of your favorite episodes, the things that have touched you, stirred your faith, um, any ideas that you have of things that you'd like for me to talk about or people that you'd like me to interview. I am open to it all. Please send me an email at info at jbethanyanderson.com or you can find me on social media and comment there. In other news, I am still planning on these spiritual direction tours across Italy and Greece. I know right now in March of 2020, that is a scary thought. But you know what? I don't want to operate out of fear. I trust the vision that God's given me. So I'm moving forward as planned, and I will be sending out more information about that soon. If you're interested in one of those trips, by the way, airfare is really cheap right now. Go to my website, jbethanyanderson.com, and click on the button at the top of the page that says, I want to know more about the Spiritual Direction Tours. Okay, that's it for today. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend and leave a rating and a review wherever you listen. 
see you in two weeks time. Have a great one. Music has been brought to you by the Blue Dot Sessions.